What does a trip to the grocery store, a greed for money, and a sick sexual desire equal? Well, on July 23rd, 2007, news of a sickening and gruesome tragedy spread across the affluent suburb of Cheshire, Connecticut, resulting in three innocent people dead and another severely injured, all in the aftermath of a brutal home invasion. It all began on the evening before the news spread. On a quiet Sunday on July 22nd, 48-year-old paediatric nurse Jennifer Hawke Petit and her 11-year-old daughter Michaela took a trip to their local supermarket. Michaela was going to make a family dinner, so her mum had taken her to pick up some ingredients so that dinner could be ready for William Petit's arrival home from work. What they could never have guessed is that they would catch the eye of 26-year-old Joshua Komosajewski. Seeing their nice clothes and car, and the dark and twisted interest he'd taken after seeing 11-year-old Michaela, he'd followed the two of them home. Hey Coffee and Crimers, I'm your host, Belle Fagan. After seeing what a nice house they lived in, he decided that he would come back in the early hours and rob them. Joshua wasn't working alone though. He brought along an accomplice called Stephen Hayes. Now, what makes this case more unusual is that at the time of the crime, Stephen presented as a man, but has since come out as a transgender woman. At 7.45pm on the night of the crime, text messages between the two read, Stephen, I'm chomping to get started, need a margarita soon. An hour passed with no reply, so Stephen wrote, we still on? Joshua, yes. Stephen, soon? Joshua, referring to his five-year-old daughter, I'm putting the kid to bed, hold your horses. Stephen, dude, the horses want to get loose, lol. The plan originally was only to rob the petite home. But as you'll see, as we go through this case, things drastically spiralled out of control. Just before 3am, Joshua, along with 44-year-old Stephen, arrived at the home. They'd agreed to tie the family up, but that's all. Tied up and unharmed. However, when they got inside, they found Dr. William Petit, an endocrinologist, asleep on the sunroom couch. Seeing a baseball bat by the stairs to the basement, Joshua grabbed the bat and beat William four to five times. They told him they were only there to rob the house and asked where the safe was. William told them that there wasn't one. From there, they took his bloodied but still alive body down to the basement and tied him up with rope and plastic zip ties around his wrists and ankles and to a support beam. Then they threw a blanket over his head. He was losing blood at a rapid rate. Jennifer, Michaela and the Petit's other daughter, 17-year-old Hayley, were found in their respective rooms. Hayley had just graduated from high school and following in her parents' footsteps was due to start college a few months later to study medicine. Their wrists and ankles were tied to their bedposts and their pillowcases were put over their heads. The two men did a quick search for cash, finding only $103 in Haley's wallet, but that's it. Determined, they began ransacking the home and found a bank statement with the family's bank details. What initially was just a home invasion was about to take a deadly turn. At around 9am, Stephen untied Jennifer and took her to her local bank. He demanded that she withdraw $15,000 or harm would come to her family. Now, he actually stayed in the car, which meant that Jennifer was able to tell the bank worker what was happening. Although she didn't have $15,000 in her account, the bank teller let her have it as Jennifer had said that the family would be killed. As Jennifer left, she immediately called 911 and the call transcripts shows her saying, we have a lady who is in our bank right now who says that her husband and children are being held at their house. She described Jennifer as being calm. Now I want you to remember that because that does come into play later on. Jennifer got back in the car with the $15,000 and together her and Stephen went back to their family home. I can imagine the relief she must have been feeling knowing that the police were going to arrive any minute and this nightmare was going to be over. Because let's face it, not many people get an opportunity to be alone in situations like this and to be able to get help. And she knew she'd given all the information to the bank teller and the bank teller was ringing 911. Tragically though, that would not be the case. 
Almost immediately on getting back, Stephen raped and strangled Jennifer to death. All this happened because allegedly Joshua had committed his own despicable acts while they'd been at the bank. He'd raped 11-year-old Michaela, and not only that, he documented her last moments of horror on his phone. So he told Stephen to even things up and that he needed to rape Jennifer. Now, the timeline isn't super clear, but it's believed that somewhere between 9.30 and 9.50 a.m., they doused Jennifer's dead body in gasoline, along with the two girls who were still alive and still tied to their beds. I assume it was a ploy to destroy any evidence that they might have left behind. They then set the house on fire. Now, while the two were about to make their escape, William had managed to loosen himself enough to escape out of the basement. He collapsed on the grass but managed to roll himself to his neighbour's house, who initially didn't even recognise him because of how severely Joshua and Stephen had beaten him. The neighbour remembers William yelling, the girls are in the house. The two criminals had already fled by stealing the petite's car. It was later found that William had lost seven pints of blood. The neighbour immediately called police and this is where I struggle to not get mad. Now, remember the bank manager had called the police. Well, for one hour, the police had been stationed down the street from the Petit's home. But because the bank manager had said that Jennifer appeared calm, they were told by their superiors to not enter the home as Jennifer was actually under suspicion as being in on the robbery. They were also told not to attempt to speak to Stephen when he arrived back at the house, nor try to make contact with anybody inside the house via phone. Instead, law enforcement set up a perimeter and monitored the situation, which meant the officers were just outside the home while the assaults, the murders and the arson were taking place. In their rush to get away in the petite's car, Stephen and Joshua actually crashed into one of the police cars at 9.56am, leading to their immediate arrests at 10.01am. The home invasion from hell had lasted seven hours. Joshua and Stephen had actually both been on parole at the time of these murders for previous burglaries. They both met each other the year before while living at a halfway house in Hartford, Connecticut. Quickly into their new friendship, they decided to become literally partners in crime, committing burglaries together in order to steal cash and credit cards from wealthy families. The lack of surveillance on these two while on parole and the fact that the police stationed themselves close to the home but not at the home while it was set ablaze led to calls for an inquiry that the police completely mishandled the whole thing and Jennifer's family outright came and criticised the police for the handling of everything. Once in custody, Joshua and Stephen immediately pointed the finger at the other, saying that it was the other one who was the mastermind behind these horrific crimes. Joshua even blamed William for the death of his family, calling him a coward who could have saved the three females if he'd really wanted to. Both men were charged with 17 counts, including sexual assault, murder, kidnapping and arson. Despite recovering from a brain injury, William Petit was in court every single day. He was only managing to sleep a couple of hours at night. He'd moved in with his parents and would wake up every single night at 3am, the exact time he was attacked. During the trial, Joshua again tried to play the blame game and this time blamed his childhood trauma on his actions. The jury heard how he'd been adopted at two weeks old. His defence team argued that when he was 14 years old, his adult foster brother, Scott Reitz, had assaulted him and in 1993 had actually been convicted of doing so and placed on the sex offenders register. But expert testimony of sexual trauma by psychotherapist Leslie Leibovitch clarified that despite this abuse, it neither caused nor justified the crimes against the Petits. In her testimony, she told the jury that Joshua's extremely religious adoptive parents refused to give him any sort of counselling or medication to help him cope with his trauma because they didn't want anyone inside or outside of their faith to know about the abuse he'd suffered. She believes that without any tools to help him cope with repeated assaults, Joshua went on to abuse one of his sisters 
and started down a path of criminal misconduct. The autopsies on the girls showed that they died from smoke inhalation. Michaela still on her bed, whereas Hayley had managed to untie herself and made her way to the staircase before succumbing to the smoke. Members of the jury were exposed to so much disturbing evidence, which included autopsy photos of the victim's bodies and the images that Joshua had taken on his phone of Michaela as he assaulted her. So much so that multiple members of the jury experienced severe psychological and emotional trauma after seeing and hearing everything presented during the trial and were actually offered free counselling from the state of Connecticut that it was that bad. After four hours of deliberation in October 2010, the jury convicted Stephen Hayes of 16 counts of the 17 counts, and he received a death penalty sentence. A year later, in October 2011, Joshua was convicted of all 17 counts and also sentenced to death. However, these two despicable humans will never see execution. Because in 2015, Connecticut abolished the death penalty and their sentences were downgraded to life imprisonment. They were resentenced to six consecutive life sentences, including an additional 140 years behind bars. So the two men will never see the light of day. The remains of the Petit's home was actually demolished due to the horrific acts that happened there and instead is now a memorial for the three women. Between his sentencing and April 2021, Joshua appealed his conviction six times and thankfully all have been denied by the courts. He has tried everything from saying that the trial's location was unfair because it had been tainted by pre-trial media attention. He then, on another appeal, argued that prosecutors failed to disclose evidence, including taped police calls at the time of the incident, which he felt violated his constitutional rights. He also alleged that prison conditions were inhumane. I mean, rightly so, they should be inhumane. Just before Joshua's trial had begun, William Petit had actually begun dating a woman named Christine, who also came to court with him every single day. They married in 2012 with all of Jennifer's family in attendance, with Jennifer's sister Cindy being quoted as saying, our family needed this to help us heal. And... Just a personal comment, that is quite big of them because not a massive amount of time had passed between the deaths and this remarriage and not all families would feel that it was appropriate for him to move on with his life, but each to their own and by the sounds of it, he's got their complete blessing. On November the 11th, 2013, Christine actually gave birth to a boy named William Petit III. At the start, I'd mentioned about Stephen Hayes identifying obviously as a man at the start of this case and later on transitioning to becoming a woman. Now he was actually a guest on a podcast so the podcast is called 15 minutes with dot 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 hosted by Joe Tomaso and it's basically phone interviews with people. He spoke on that podcast explaining that he was experiencing a lot of problems now that he was presenting as a female. He said a lot of people accept it but at the facility that he's being held at you have a lot of racists and bigots on staff and they're not happy with it. And there's actually two of them in the facility that he's in that are feminine. He still used the name Stephen on the podcast and didn't explain that there were different pronouns or anything that he would prefer. And he spoke about being affected by a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria in which a person's outward appearance doesn't align with their mental and emotional state. And he also talks about how he had a recurring drug problem. So he did say on the podcast very clearly that he was transgender and he was diagnosed at 16 with sexual identity disorder, but that his family never acknowledged it and it was never treated. A spokeswoman for the prison system said that the prison system doesn't pay for gender affirmation surgeries, but it does spend $60,000 a year and up to $600 per inmate for medication to treat inmates who have gender dysphoria. So that's like an annual cost of about $5,500 per inmate. On the podcast, Stephen said that he was trying to get other things as part of his gender transition, but he didn't elaborate on what those things were. 
What I found really interesting was that during the podcast, Stephen did actually express remorse for the killings. And not only that, but he denounced Joshua's appeals. And he said that there is no defence for what we did. He wants no part of Joshua's appeal processes and said that the family doesn't deserve to go through any more heartache. He said that at the time of the crime, he'd had a drug relapse and was in massive financial straits, saying that he wasn't a monster. It was just circumstances. Not only that, but he has found religion and become an Orthodox Jew. And in 2014, he sued the state for violating his First Amendment right to free exercise of religion and the Eighth Amendment right against cruel and unusual punishment by denying him kosher food. He demanded $15,000 in punitive and compensatory damages for intentional infliction of pain, suffering, and resulting weight loss from the deliberate denial of this kosher diet. However, a judge ruled against him and said that he'd found that his meals, which were certified by two rabbis who monitor the preparation of kosher food in the prison system, were sufficient to meet the kosher standards. When researching this case, I saw a headline saying taxpayers now paying for sex change of man sentenced to death for raping, murdering a young family. And frankly... (laughs) That just gave me chills and made me sick to my stomach because obviously I outlined a minute ago how much it is costing the state to pay for this kind of hormone therapy and it just boggles my mind. I just feel like it's another blow to the Petit family because not only are taxpayers covering the cost of Stephen Hayes' incarceration, which is six life sentences, but they're also footing the bill for this desire to transition into a woman. And also the other thing that just boggles my mind is the fact that this podcast host even gave him the time of day. Like why, why is he being given his 15 minutes of fame so that he can tell his story about his transition and things like that? I just don't get it. Not long after his wife and daughter's death, William set up the Petit Family Foundation, which through donations provides help to educate young people, especially in the sciences, help support those with chronic illnesses because Jennifer actually had MS at the time of her death, and to help protect those affected by violence. All of these things inspired by the lives and the memory of Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela. You can find out more of their work at www.petitfamilyfoundation.org. Thanks for listening. To see today's case photos, click on the link in the case description to join the Cup of Coffee and Crime Facebook discussion group. And if you're enjoying being here, please leave a review on whatever platform you get your podcasts. Until next week, stay safe.